you know, some of that is true. We stand in the front and wave, wave our stick around, you know, but the reality is, is that um, the conductor will, um, has different functions depending on what kind of concert we're presenting. If it's a concert of uh, traditional classical repertoire um, played by some of the great orchestras in the world, then there's an old saying that says, the conductor should really just not get in the way. And there's more truth to that than there than it is a, a, a joke, tongue in cheek. You know, um, the fact of the matter is that the greatest orchestras, Chicago Symphony, New York Philharmonic, Berlin Philharmonic, London Symphony, if you're doing another set of Beethoven or Tchaikovsky or Brahms or some of the very classic um, orchestral repertoire, they just need to get started together, show them the tempo, and and they're off. Basically, it's very important with the top ensembles that if you're playing standard repertoire that they have played for thousands of performances, it's very important that you only you don't burden or clog up the creative process with uh, with unnecessary gestures or or um, try to make music that is exactly the same as they have played for many years. So you know. If, if you're doing an interpretation that has been heard before, stay out of the way, get them started, show them a little retard here or there, or a cadence kind of point, set the next tempo for the next movement. But if you're a conductor of a production with music that any of the orchestras have never seen before, it's new music to them. They have to learn notes, phrases, tempi, articulation, uh, and the, the musical gesture on all this, then the conductor has a, a very difficult and busy job. He's trying to teach. He's doing a lot of teaching. The best conductors can still do most of that teaching just with their stick, you know, just with the baton. And there's a tremendous amount of stuff that you can do with this and, and the other, the left hand, if you're a right-handed uh, conductor. Um, and with the greatest orchestras, I try to minimize the amount of time that I spend talking in between pieces or explaining things. I try to show it as much as I can. And again, with great ensembles, you can, you'd be amazed what you can get through. Even today, they were a wonderful orchestra, mostly members of the uh, opera company here in Toronto. And uh, you're at the University of Waterloo? Or I conducted Kitchener-Waterloo uh, okay. previously, both in, in Kitchener and, and they were here as, as well with me um, at the Sony Center. And uh, this orchestra compares very favorably to that. I mean, they're very experienced and they're reading through everything very quickly. So I really appreciate that, the, the art of sight reading new scores and being able to uh, synthesize that quickly, internalize that quickly and, and uh, make music out of it. So it makes my job easier if they can read the notes quickly. But yeah, just from a generic answer, with new productions, with video uh, sync that I have to deal with. Um, I think that that is a much more all encompassing job for the conductor. He has to show a lot and he has to pace the show. And in my case, we, we talk to the audience, introduce pieces, tell them some history of the Final Fantasy game series, um, what some of the, the, the preferences of the composers are. All these things are rather, uh, uh, important for the fan fans you know they they're really interested in in hearing this stuff and how it ties to the music that we're performing so there's a lot more going on in that as i say in a traditional orchestral concert of traditional repertoire there's a lot less that i have to deal with and so having done all those you know yeah. Yes, definitely. Uh, the, the, the easy answer is that absolutely, you should see actually in the rehearsals, at this point, we've worked together for so many years that he, he just allows me to go ahead. I know all the tempe and how they should be, but we're introducing new scores all the time, some of which we're arranging and orchestrating for the Distant Worlds concerts, and some of which uh, Nobusan actually has a team in Japan that does many of these orchestrations as well. So we're kind of splitting those duties between his team and our AWR music team. 
So when a new score comes in and we're rehearsing it for the first time and we've just introduced a lot of new things, even while I'm conducting, I'm looking at him at tempo. I'm saying, well, higher, you know, little tiny adjustments. Mostly it's about tempo. The music is something that I can very quickly synthesize and, and deal with. Um, and I think that's an important function for a conductor to be able to look at a new score quickly and decide the important points. This melody line has to be heard. That little uh, percussion effect is very critical. Refer to the original soundtrack and see what fans were listening to. Because even in this new orchestration, one needs to, you know, it. many times when we orchestrate things, certain effects that the fans are used to get kind of buried into the orchestra, not for any um, uh, purposeful reason, but you know, the, the orchestra is very thick and maybe it's uh, overly orchestrated in a spot and a critical little like piccolo note or, or viola line gets buried in there a little bit. And that's where my job is to rebalance all the instruments live. And in a very limited rehearsal time, you know, to say quickly stop, I need, you know, all the strings to go down to pianissimo so I can hear the oboe solo over there. Uh, please percussion, that mark tree spill over there is incredibly important to the fans. I need, mark that up from pianissimo to mezzo forte or whatever it might be. You do all these things on board very quickly. I glance over to Nobu every now and then. He says, yeah, more of that or this. Today, after having played Final Fantasy VII main theme many, many times, a little thing that's been bothering me for, for years after playing that was that the harp seemed to drop out, I felt, one measure early in this particular sequence. And I said to, I stopped everything. I said, finally, you're sitting here with me. Shouldn't that harp continue for another bar or two? And he says, Yes, I think so. First of all, a lot of these things, the thousands of hours of music that he's written, you know, to try to get him to reach back in your memory and think about that one. But in this case, he and I agree. Basically, we agree on, on almost all the things that we're working on. But in this case, he said, yeah. So here in Toronto, we're adding the extra bar of harp. Little touches like that, you know, constantly refining things. So it's like a real time mixing. It really channel. is. Yeah. It really is both musically. Uh, balance, uh, tempo, always tempo adjustments. Literally, our adjustments are two beats per minute, up or down, three beats per minute. Because generally I'm getting there and it's just tiny little adjustments pushing, you know. This phrase is a very famous one, but it's also that, that philosophy it's not just Wagner, but when you talk to most of the great pedagogues in music uh, and many conductors as well and composers, of course, I'll, I'll, I'll um, quantify that a little bit later. But, you know, most people of the really experienced ones will say, when in doubt, if you're a violinist, if you're a trumpet player, woodwind player, whatever you might be doing, when in doubt, think of how you would sing that phrase. When you're trying to learn a new piece of music and there's this, this phrasing there, sing it to yourself once in your practice room. And most of the time, the exact phrase and peak of the, the phrase and the articulation will be revealed to you just by that. So Wagner's not wrong, and this is something that's been taken to heart by a lot of instrumentalists, that you know, you're playing a great violin concerto and um, you're deciding, well, is the peak of the melody that beat, the third beat of that bar, or should I continue it to the next downbeat? Architecturally, what is this, the melodic structure? What should be the main emphasis? So now we're getting to minutia a little bit, but it really makes a difference, <laughs> all these things, and especially in the music of Wagner, which is so melody-driven. And by the way, it's no secret here, the music of Uematsu is completely melody-driven. I mean, melody and structure are it for him. Um, you know, you were, you were speaking about this before. There, I often compare composers of video game music. Um, what makes Uematsu different from others? You know, that kind of thing. Um, this whole idea of composing with melody and structure first, that's the primary thing. All else, all the other orchestration, arrangement, Variation, that's all down the line. But 
this is how the, if you look at the greatest uh, composers throughout history, this was always the driving thing. I, you know, even as you start getting into you know, contemporary composers, still there's a very big difference. And if we're talking about film music, for instance, very big difference between um, the music of a John Williams. And, you know, if you go in and, and you hear the, the music of Star Wars and everyone comes out of the movie theater singing these, these things or Indiana Jones or E.T. or whatever it might be, but melody and structure driven. So you come out of the movie theater knowing these themes. Come out of the movie theater for Lord of the Rings or something else. Lord of the Rings is great. Howard Shore is fantastic. You'll know maybe the main theme, you know, but so many of the battle scenes, and this happens in a lot of video game music too, is there's percussion loops. It's really more catching the hits, whatever the, whether it's a lightsaber or it's a, a real sword, but it's catching all the hits. And, and we know how to do that as writers. There's whole universities and courses about film scoring and, and, and simpty and, and catching these, these cues. We all know how to do it. Where, where I feel the genius comes in is when you're writing with melody and even as Luke and his father are battling, you're going to hear those two melodic phrases battling. It's not just percussion loops and, you know, cymbals hitting and, and, and drums hitting, but it's melodically developing this, stressing the melody and then releasing it here and sometimes releasing it tragically. He doesn't win, you know, the protagonist, the antagonist wins. And so, you know, there's this tragic element and the way that con composers did that from Beethoven, you know, on up, they, that's how they composed. So the, that is something that I find is a very big difference between various composers, not just in the classical realm, but also in video game music and in film scoring. Are you writing, as you say, with light motifs? Are you writing with, you know, each character gets a theme or, or, or each battle or each world or each environment has a thing? Or is it just a main theme and battle music, you know, loops? And so many of the games are, you know, basically a shoot 'em up kind of protagonist game. And really that's what they want is they want 90 second or two minute loops of this percussion stuff. Whereas when Uematsu has this stuff, listen to this throughout history, there's a melody, there's development. And this melody over 25 years can also develop and have variations. You started hinting at that, but I mean, look at Chocobo. I mean, there's 75, 100 variations of the Chocobo theme and many others, you know, uh, battle music that's brought back later in the series that the melody is still there and, and developed even by other composers. But I think that is the combination of Final Fantasy being an RPG game and that Uematsu started at the very beginning with these light motifs and these characters and carrying that through has endeared all the fans. And that's why this works as a concert. You know, I, think about these other games. Can, can a World of Warcraft, can a Halo, can a, uh, uh, I don't know, um, you know, you name it, but one of these single action, you know, shooter games, can that really work as a music concert with the music of that? I don't know. And we've thought about this long and hard and it's, there's not that many other platforms that can work that way. I mean, Distant Worlds is different than other productions that are out there. Distant Worlds is dedicated to presenting the music as close to the way it was heard in the game as possible. Even if it was 8-bit and we've orchestrated it up to full orchestra, it's still very, very faithful to what was there in the original. When we do the opera, from Final Fantasy, VI, Final Fantasy, Final Fantasy VI, Mario and, and uh, Draco, it's the opera just as you heard it, even though there was no recorded vocal in Final Fantasy, Final Fantasy VI. But it's very faithful to what the fans heard. It's one of our most popular pieces. Some of the eight-bit stuff, you know. He uh, Nobusan just said he Terra's theme was his favorite. Final Fantasy VI again, eight-bit, very simple thing. Um, and what we play with orchestra is blown up and expanded, but it's simply what you heard in the game. Now that's different than a lot of other concert productions of video game music where you're in the mind of the arranger. And really you're focusing on the mind of the arranger. It'll be based on themes, but they're snippets of things. Zelda, you know, uh, Symphony of the Goddesses. This is 
a film that's scored and there's just snippets of themes throughout that. It's about the arranger. I've done many of these with the, uh, the WDR uh, in Cologne based on Nintendo games, based on all kinds of different games, and Uematsu as well. But it's more about the, the arranger's mind and, and this wonderful creativity of, of bringing something to life. But that's a different experience than what Distant Worlds is. We're dedicated to presenting the music very close to the way the fans heard it. And I think that's why there's this kind of uh, wonderful connection with the fans on these concerts. And they're very faithful about the concerts. They really, they know what they're getting here, you know, so uh, we're trying to stay very close to that, so. Oh, I can't sing, but I have a, a great appreciation uh, for the architecture of, of singing this melody. And as bad as you might be as a singer, if you can just look at this score and sing it through in your crotchety voice, whatever it might be, you'll still understand where that singer has to breathe in it. And that's what Wagner is talking about, that until the conductor puts himself in the mind, especially opera conductors, in the mind of accompanying the singer and knowing that this is what the singer needs. Tempo is so critical for singers. I mean, that is a performance thing. If I'm two beats per minute too slow for them, they're running out of breath at the end of the phrase. If I'm two beats per minute too fast, they can't get all the words out clearly because I'm rushing it. Literally, you have to hit this on the nose. And video game music, remember, I have a screen overhead on Distant Worlds. So I'm conscious of the timing, what I call soft sync synchronization. I'm very conscious of the timing and I'm watching the cues go by. And if we're getting there a little too quickly, I sl slow the orchestra down. And if I get to the end and I'm a little ahead, some of the fermati at the end or some of the last couple of temp tempi, I'll do a bigger retard to try to match that film ending a little bit. So it's really live scoring that's happening here. And it's a great, it's a, a lot of fun for me and a great, uh, great art to be able to do that well. And nowadays, there's a lot more orchestras that are doing film with, with orchestra. I think tonight, as a matter of fact, uh, at Sony Center, they're doing Gladiator with orchestra. That has a lot more effects than synthesizer, I think Zimmer or whatever. Uh, so it's a little different experience. But I've conducted The Wizard of Oz, full movie, full live with orchestra. And that is the most difficult thing I think I've ever done because it's very easy to accompany Judy Garland singing Somewhere Over the Rainbow, no problem. But on the film, conducting those munchkins, and it's impossible. <laughs> so, so that kind of thing is, is very difficult. But uh, yes, you have to think about the melody, and that drives the architecture of it. For Uematsu, I mean, it's definitely the way he writes. He's thinking classic melodies all the time. So. It, live on the film, on the on the concert, it is soft synchronization, as I was saying before. The definition of that means that I drive the video, and my video operator, who works with us all the time, he has two video sources, and we split up for each song that we're doing. We split up the video cues into maybe two or three or four different sources, and he's alternating between them. As I so I drive the show by starting the downbeat and he's watching for my downbeat of music and then he starts video and i'm going along in the proper tempo and then it's a little cat and mouse game of sometimes chris will crossfade into the next source when he knows that i've already gone into that and other times i will slow down to catch something and so it this is a constant onboard analog let's put it that way you know, fluid thing for the concert. Now for scoring the film, it's a much more scientific and, you know, uh, it, there's sympathy, there's time code, and there's actual math involved of making sure that we're hitting every single uh, cue. But no, Distant Worlds does not use click track. I wanna make that perfectly clear. There's plenty of productions that do, and we could, but to put an entire orchestra on that stage, wearing headsets, listening to click track, and chorus and everything, remove some of the musicianship, musicianship that is on the stage. In other words, they can't hear as well each other and they start listening to click only. And we very quickly dissolve into something else 
balances are off, all kinds of things are just listening to click. So it's a very different experience. There are places where you want that. You want musicians to be on click track, Bugs Bunny on Broadway. Uh, it's a show that I helped put together. It's all click, you know, playing these crazy wacky cartoons, very difficult to play for the orchestra. Yes, you need click to possibly, when the rabbit hits the wall, if the cymbal crashes two beats later, everyone knows it. The five-year-old knows it, right? So you have to have a click track with that kind of, but not when we're doing a live orchestra concert with Distant Worlds. There are others that, that need it, so. I think in general, working with orchestras, uh, you know, I, I was a violinist. I, I keep saying was, I still am a violinist. Next week I'm playing violin in Houston on, on our chamber music version of, of the music of Final Fantasy, which is called A New World, Intimate Music from Final Fantasy. And that plays in small chamber music things with just 11 musicians. And, and I actually play one piece on violin as well. But, and when Nobu comes out, he plays organ with me, as a matter of fact, he, uh, keyboards. But the reality is, is that coming out of the world of musicians, I think I probably had an enhanced appreciation for what goes into um, putting together concerts from a musician standpoint and what we'd like to see in a conductor as a musician in the orchestra. So I'd like to think that I'm very sensitive to that. The reverse of that is that the more I dig into orchestras live, and I've been doing it for a long time now, the more I can pick up new orchestration tricks and different ideas as we're playing all these scores. You, all of us as composers and, and orchestrators and arrangers, we pick up little, wow, that's a cool effect. I'm going to use that over there. Or this is really cool. It would be very neat if that were transposed into the lower woodwinds instead of where it is in the strings. So we pick up all these things. So how has it influenced me? I think just working with orchestras and ought to influence any composer. You learn so much about what's possible and what's not possible. Um, and generally there's so much more possible than you, than you think. Uh, rarely have we gotten to a point where we've overwritten so far that an orchestra can't manage. So I find that exciting, you know, to, that's an effect I really want to use on another, another project or, or something like that. So uh, also, you know, the experience of working with, with uh, the film industry part um, influences me a lot because there it's so tight to time code and, and uh, uh, action on, on film that it's a little bit different way of scoring things um, than orchestrating for a live concert. There, there's a little bit more freedom with that, I think. With film, you have to be conscious of, um, am I going to fix something in the mix in terms of digging out this melody? Or can I pre-write this from an orchestration standpoint so I can really deliver uh, this melody will ride on top of that effect, a big battle thing going on, but still hearing that rather than trying to fix this in the mix, which is always difficult, you know, really reaching for an individual mic on that instrument or that. So yes, it does influence us in terms of orchestration, both the live concerts and working with film, all these things, there should be a give and take. You should grow, you know, the, the day you stop learning and growing from your experiences, then it's time to start retiring or something, I think, but yeah. I'm enjoying it a lot still, so. Very funny, you know, I think there's still a faction of the world out there that still, when you tell them, we're conducting concerts of video game music, they look at you like, what? What could that possibly be? There's still a good amount of people out there that, that think that. And unfortunately, some administrators with major orchestras are still in that kind of uh, tunnel vision thing. But the reality is that in certain regions of the world, concerts of video game music are much more accepted. For instance, in Japan, um, without video screen, concerts of, of video game music have been going on since, what, 1999 or thereabouts, maybe before that, but I think 99 was the, the beginning that I know of. 
uh, certainly the Final Fantasy concerts started back then with just concerts, no video screens, nothing, just they were accepted as concert events there. And it took all those years. It wasn't until 2004, 2005, till it came to North America or Europe or anything. So that already was behind that curve. Um, and right now, orchestras in North America are much more readily accepting the idea of uh, video game music as a regular concert event. Um, they've launched full time into inviting film with orchestra onto concert stages. That's being done much more often uh, and video game music. But in Europe, it's still very difficult to get orchestras. I mean, orchestras to actually engage with video game music. It's very different for us to go out and hire an orchestra. And we do that all the time. So we've played Europe a lot, but it's not so much the orchestra's hiring us as it is a third party presenter who's engaging an orchestra, engaging a venue, putting this thing together. And it's a very expensive production to be able to do that. Um, you know, we're a lot of musicians, Distant Worlds, we're over 100 on stage. So it's, the musicians are costly, the venue is costly. There's all these things that lead into it. So I would say that the, uh, how have the fans gotten more sophisticated? I, I, I think the Final Fantasy fans have really focused in on the, on the Distant Worlds tour and they really know all the things that are possible. And if they're getting more sophisticated, it's about you're not doing enough of three or nine or, you know, that kind of thing. Or when are you going to do the offshoot games? I mean, they're very focused on their world of Final Fantasy. And it's great. We keep introducing new scores because the, the library of Final Fantasy is infinite. I mean, literally infinite. It's hundreds and thousands of hours of music of every single game. We can't possibly dig everything out. We already have 110, 120 scores in our Distant Worlds library that we're rotating. We couldn't possibly, you know, do everything in one or two or three nights. It would take a week or more to play every score. So I would say the question is fans of other video game uh, platforms, um, are they getting to a point where they're demanding concerts? And there's not many others. You know, there's a couple of other production video games live is out there, but that's more of a spectacle. It's not, I don't view it as, as, you know, the acoustic orchestra concert, you know, they have somebody climbing up and doing a battle and there's a light show going on. That's all good. But the fans of Final Fantasy, I mean, I think there's a place for that, but the fans of Final Fantasy know that this is a concert experience and they really actually, they seem to be craving that concert experience. It's an absolutely amazing thing to witness. I don't know if you've seen the concerts at all, but if you're going to be there tomorrow night, you'll, you'll get a taste of this because it's completely sold out. There's no tickets available, but as quiet as possible during the performance and as overwhelming of a standing ovation after most of these pieces, it's this wonderful combination of those two reactions that is better than any classical concert or anything else I've ever done. You know, they're sitting on the edge of their seats to hear every note, but the, the appreciation is on the overwhelming side compared to classical or operatic or, and you know, pop and rock concerts, you know, they're cheering and singing along and standing in the aisles while the concert's going on. None of that during this. They're sitting quietly listening, but you know, they're standing up for the standing ovations afterwards uh, equivalent to, you know, some of the great rock concerts, things like that. So it's a great hybrid audience. Um, it remains to be seen about other platforms, whether we can bring that. And there are many that we're working on and, and talking to, but it remains to be seen. So uh, I'm not sure. <laughs> Here, it, the answer is yes and no. The answer... It's very interesting. The reason we have video screens, and it started here in the US, the reason we have that with these games is because, this is a little secret here, but because presenters are the ones that are pushing for that. Because the presenters, and I'm not dissing all of them, <laughs> but their minds were doing a music of video game, a, a concert of video game music. How can you do a concert of video game music without having a video screen? 
That's how their mind thinks. So therefore, that was the easy way to go. And frankly, it is enhanced. We've done some things to play with the screen, some live onboard things that we play with, and it's worked out very well. And the fans, they've seen all these images a million times. This audience would still be okay with it if the screen went dead and we just did the concert. Our Final Fantasy audience, I don't think all of them would be, but Final Fantasy fans would be. They understand it. They're there for the music. They really are. Um, I think that it's probably not necessary for, and, and it's not used for a lot of the concerts that are based on arrangers' fantasies based on video game themes. We don't use that a lot. I mean, a lot of the concerts that I've done with the WDR and others, you know, it's it's just a, a concert. You know, you're here to hear this fantasy based on these video game themes. Uh, and fans do accept that too. But, you know, the whole format of doing concerts is different in each region of the world. And we've run into that a lot. Um, the, the Final Fantasy family is the same throughout the world. That's the amazing thing. But the format of concerts, I mean, you can go to hear the Vienna Philharmonic or the London Symphony or the Berlin Philharmonic in Berlin for 15 euros. Very little money. Yeah. You can't do that here in the United States. We have officials elected I, here. We're, we're speaking in Toronto, but we have officials elected in the United States that believe in not, you know, taxation being as low as possible. So they're not supporting the arts. So therefore, all the orchestras have to make it a commercial venture. They really have to charge ticket prices that are higher. And it's much more difficult on fans that way. And we're, we're very thankful that we're still selling out. But it's a dichotomy of that. So when I go out and do a fantasy, you know, uh, of, based on the themes of Zelda or or uh, Nintendo games or or whatever it might be, the, people can get into those concerts for twenty five euros or uh, very inexpensive. That's a complete. That's a a big point about this um, that it's more accessible. Uh, and that happens a lot in Asia as well in various markets. Um, so I think that there are some regional things that enter into that, into the economics. And I mean, you know, you and I are talking here on the eve of our playing Toronto Sony Center. That will be, this is a bit of history here, our 99th performance of Distant Worlds. You know, we've been going for seven years now, which is amazing and extended and we see many more years uh, coming up here, but this is a very, you know, interesting point that we're at 99 performances. Square Enix immediately grabbed onto this and said, well, you must go to Japan for your 100th performance. So Distant Worlds will play in Tokyo and Osaka the third week of January before we play the New Jersey Performing Arts Center, January 31st. That was going to be our 100th performance. Now our 100th is in Tokyo. Um, but it's very interesting and they, you know, they, they find this a very significant momentous event. Uh, I think for us and for most of the fans, we think, okay, so then there's 101 and 102. You know, it, it's not as much of a watershed, but maybe I should. Maybe one day I'll stand back and be able to say, wow, 100 performances of Distant Worlds. That's, it's amazing that we're, we're here and doing it. So, uh, and I nev never get tired of the music. I mean, there's, there's always new scores to discover and new compilations of themes to put together and uh, it's an endless thing. It's really interesting. So.